All right, hello and welcome to your programming lecture. And this one is going to be uh, pretty heavy on the programming. So we're going to talk about quite a few things, and I cannot click for some reason. Uh, and that will culminate in making this Pong game that you might have heard of. Uh, it's a classic. So let us get started. Uh, it's going to be pretty much all programming today. We know mostly all of Scratch at the moment and there's just a few extra things uh, that I want to get you up to speed on and then uh, then we will leave Scratch soon in a couple weeks. It is a sad day but it's time for us to move on. So the first thing that I want to talk about is uh, clones. So when you have your sprite, let's see am I capable of drawing at the moment? Let's get that away. Let's try it. So you have your current sprite, but then that sprite is capable of cloning itself. So it can make little tiny clones over here, as many as you want, actually. Uh, and what I want to do is use that to make a little star field with clones. So make a bunch of little stars, have them like be moving around, be all cool looking. Uh, and that's that's how I would like to teach this to you. So let's try it. So we're gonna get rid of the scratch cat. Sorry, scratch cat. Uh, let's find a star. I will take that one. And we gotta set the scene, of course. So let's do some space. Uh, get the stars in the background. Very very nice. So now we have our star sprite. It lives alone, but let's give it some friends. Let's zoom into that. So when I start this program with the normal green flag, I can say, dun dun dun, create a clone of myself. And it can also clone other things, but right now there's no other sprites. So create a clone of myself. And I click it, and it did it, but we can't see it because it's right on top of the other one. You see that? So now there's two stars. Click the stop button to get rid of it. Uh, get rid of the clones. All right. What can we do with this? Well, this is where this event comes into play. Every clone, when it begins, when it gets born, I guess, you can affect it with a different program uh, that starts when you use this block. All right. So whenever a clone begins its life, it will do some other thing. And let's, uh, let's have some fun with that. So maybe, uh, to get it to not be on top of its father or mother, let's have it go to a random position once it begins its life as a clone. So there we go. Click it again, click it again. Right now there's only two clones at the moment, because uh, that's what it means to have the program start. There's no clones and it creates one clone. But we know how to repeat stuff. We can. A forever loop would probably not be the best idea right now. We can make 10 clones of ourselves. Aha! So now 10 times we'll make a clone of ourselves, and that clone will go to a random spot. Oh, I'm liking that. Let's do it 50 times. But actually, let's do it only 5 so we see what's really happening. There are a total of 6 stars at the moment. So there are the clones, and then the original one didn't go away. Okay? So that's going to become useful or maybe not in a little bit. So let's make 50 because we can and now we have a bunch of stars but they're all kind of boring because they're in the same orientation, they're the same size. Oh but we can fix that. Yes we can, we can change our looks a little bit. We can change our size and the size can actually be bigger than 100 if you if you ever wondered. Make it 200 but we'll keep our stars small because that's what stars look like. Uh, so we'll change, actually, sorry, we'll set our size to a certain percentage, and we'll also, uh, I don't know, we can also rotate them around a little bit too, so maybe we can give them uh, a random direction to, to point in, okay, because right now it's pointed 90 degrees and we can just flip it around between 0 and 360. So now let's let's use randomness. So uh, pick a random number, uh, a random percentage. Well, we want to always see our star, so let's make it go between 10% and 100% randomly. And then our direction can be a random number between 
I don't know, zero degrees and 360. Okay. So now, when I start the program, it'll make 50 stars, and then when those stars begin their lives, uh, the it will start out going to a random position, then it will pick a random size and also a random direction. So it'll not look the same anymore, is the idea. And that's pretty cool, I think. Yeah. Uh, gosh. The size might be a little too big for our stars. Uh, make it 75 or something. I don't I don't know. But I think 100 is probably okay. And you can click it again and it'll do different things because it's always random. And one thing that might bother you is that original star. See how it never moves? Uh, that's because this program only affects clones, not the original. Uh, if that bothers you as much as it does me, what you can do is hide the original. You can have it hide, and so then only the other clones will be shown, uh, but you have to explicitly show them now because when you make a clone of a hidden thing, it's going to also be hidden. So we'll show the clones, but not the, not the parent. Okay, so now we've solved that problem. And maybe we can have some extra fun. We can have these, like, they have a direction already that's random. Let's have them, like, move slowly in space. Uh, have them move, like, one step. And we'll have them do that for the rest of time. Actually, uh, like that. So forever, after they've chosen their size and direction, Please move in a random direction, whichever one you choose for yourself. And there they go! Whee! And the issue with Scratch is that once you get to the edge, you're kind of stuck there. So maybe we can make them bounce off the edge if they ever hit it. We know how to do that. That looks good to me. So now if they ever hit the edge, I mean, it's not like a real star, but it'll bounce off. All right, and then the one last thing that I want to show you, the one last cool thing, is uh, this size of our star also uh, should affect maybe its transparency. Let's let's make this be a thing. Let's make uh, let's make smaller stars more transparent. And the way we'll do this is with variables, but let's let's figure out how. Uh, well, the looks is how we get transparency. It's a, it's an effect. It's called the ghost effect, and it goes between zero and a hundred. Zero means there's no like there's no transparency, and a hundred means fully transparent, and then any number in between is like see-through. So we can do this randomly as well down here. And what I'd like to do is if the stars are small, they should also be transparent. So uh, this is what we can do. If we have a small, like here is our, uh, here's our star. If its size is small, if our, if our star's size is like 10, we want its transparency or its ghost effect. I don't know. And it's a percentage. Let's set that to also be like, I don't know, 100 minus size. Yeah, so full size stars, if size is 100, then the ghost effect. Oops, sorry, I'm just having trouble writing today, apparently. Then the ghost effect, the percentage of that will be 100 minus our size, and so for a perfectly large, right in front of a star, the ghost effect will be zero. And that's exactly what we wanted, because zero means not transparent. But this one will be like, I don't know, 90 transparent, 90% 90 transparent. So what we can do to make this work is we can save our size in a variable. So we can say size and fill it with a random number between 10 and 100 like we were doing. And we can use that in the ghost effect to uh, achieve what we're going for. Okay, so 
Hopefully that makes sense, or if it doesn't, it will when you see it. Let's make our normal star be normal. And so the size and the ghost effect, they are linked. They should be linked by a variable. Let's, let's make it called size. All right, so what we'll do is we'll set a variable called size. Oh gosh, maybe that's confusing, but I have a variable called size and then there's also the sprites size. Maybe we should change that just so that it's not confusing. Uh, we can make a variable called how big am I? And that can be set to a random number between 10 and 100. Uh, so we can then set the size to be that variable. And we can also set the ghost effect to be not the same as the variable, but 100 minus that variable. Okay, so farther things away, smaller things will be more transparent because ghost effect works backwards from 0 to 100. Okay, so we're going to put here uh, 100 minus. How big am I? So now, uh, make a comment here. When how big am I is large, the ghost effect is closer to zero. So it, it's like the star is closer to the viewer. So less transparency. When it's small, The ghost effect is large, which means that we're having more transparency. Hopefully that clears that up. So now when I press this button, I'm going to make a bunch of, well, 50 exactly, 50 clones, and they're going to go to a random spot. They're going to have a specific size, which is linked to its transparency. They're going to point in a random direction, and they're going to move in that direction until they hit a wall and bounce off. And they'll move very slowly because we made them move at one step per, per iteration, per, I guess, per how fast that Scratch executes things. So that's fun, I hope uh, you agree. And we can have like a light speed effect, of course. We can make it move 10 steps at a time. It's like, woo, stars all over the place. Uh, that's kind of, I don't know, that makes me feel uneasy for some reason. Oh, let's make them slow again. So that is our star field, and uh, that is an example of using clones. So uh, I think my dinner is almost ready, so I'm going to go eat that, and I'll be back for messages. All right, I have returned, and uh, let us move on. So. We did this project before about ghosts, and if you believe in them, they appear. Well, uh, I want to try it a different way. It's a bit more efficient, doesn't require infinite loops, and we can do it with this thing called message passing. So let me try and define that. So message passing is the concept, and that is a bad A. There we go. So what that is, is you have, you're a program, a sprite is a program in Scratch, so uh, you have something that you want to send to somebody. You have a little card, has a stamp, things like that. And, well, you want to send it, potentially, to multiple people. And so this is probably a mad metaphor, but there's a thing called message passing where you can send the same information to a bunch of different people at the same time. So maybe it's more like, it's better to like draw this as like a megaphone maybe. You're, you're kind of sending something and a lot of people are listening, okay? So you have, you're the sender of the message and then you have these listeners, which are other programs. And they're just waiting because they might get your message and uh, they will respond to certain messages and act accordingly. So that's the idea. There's this concept called messages, which you can pass to other people. Uh, the sender sends to multiple, potentially, listeners. 
who do something depending on the message that they get and uh, that's about it. So let's make our ghosts scene again and I, I got us started and let's do that using message passing and always got to give Scratch Cat his actual name. So the idea is, well, we can do the same thing as before, right? We can, when we start the program with the little green flag, these are the ones that we're going to talk about later. Uh, when we start the green flag, we'll, I don't know, ask if you believe in ghosts as usual. And that, that's over here, isn't it? Yeah. Do you believe in ghosts? Question mark? And wait, and then our answer is going to get put right here. And we want to see if it was yes. If answer happened to be yes, we won't ask twice this time. We'll just ask once. If it was yes, then we're going to send a message to our ghost characters to have them show themselves, okay? So we want them to start out uh, hidden when the, when the program begins. We want them to start out hidden. So let's go and let's hide all of them. And we'll duplicate this program for everybody. And now they're all starting out hidden. Okay. So if the answer is yes, here's what we'll do. We're going to make a new message. This one's called message one. And gosh, where where is that named? That's no fun. Can we, can I edit this one perhaps? No, well, we'll just make a new message. So. Or actually, let's call it show yourself. That will be the name of the message. OK. And I'm calling it this for a reason. Like, I'm using lowercase and then capitals and no spaces. You can use spaces in Scratch, but this is more like a variable name in Python that we'll get to later. So I have no clue where these messages are. like. Range is not in the variables tab, so I guess you're just stuck with message one for forever. All right, so what this can do is broadcast, send the message, show yourself, and it's going to send this message to everybody. Okay, that is the idea. And let us let us watch and make it work. Yeah, darn. Okay, so. When I broadcast this message, going back to this picture, it's like I'm shouting. And anybody who's listening for that message uh, is paying attention. OK, so for example, the bat starts out hidden. Let me zoom in and orient this all properly. The bat starts out hidden. Actually, here, there. They all start out hidden. But when they receive this message that I've called show yourself, well, it'll do exactly what you think. It'll show itself. You see how there's no loop involved? It's just it's a, a matter of waiting for this message to be given to you. And so every other ghost will do the same thing. They will listen for this show yourself message. And once they receive that, they will execute a program. And my program is very short. It's just show. OK? So now if I run this, do you believe in ghosts, and I type yes and hit enter, it will broadcast that message. And everybody who is sitting around waiting, try it again, everybody who is sitting around waiting uh, gets shown. They, they execute their program. Now that message does not need to be broadcast. It's only ever broadcasted uh, when answer is yes. Otherwise, this block does not get executed at all. There's no else. It just goes straight down to the end of the program. So if I say no, nothing happens. It's only when yes is typed in and selected 
that that message is broadcast. Okay, that is the idea. And that's message passing for you. Not too bad. Uh, this is kind of like, a, it's a really cool concept in programming. Uh, I like that it, we're, we're able to teach it to you this early. Uh, in Python, we'll have kind of similar operations. They'll be called functions, okay? And we'll get to a, a different kind of function-like thing next time. All right, moving on to the main attraction today, we're gonna do single-player Pong. And if you've never heard of Pong, it's just this little program where it's like one of the first video games, right? And you have these two paddles. It's like you're playing ping pong on a table and you're, you're looking top down on the on the thing and you have the two paddles and you have a ball that is like whooshing on to one side and it bounces and it'll bounce off the the paddle and come back and hopefully well the goal is to get it past the other person it's like half ping pong half soccer or something like that that's maybe foosball is a better a better choice so uh, we're gonna do the single player version of this which means that there's only one guy and the everything else, he's playing against himself and the ball will just bounce off this side okay that is my idea so let's try and make this happen so I'll save this so you can see it and I'm just gonna click the page again to reload here's what we're gonna do to make our pong happen we are going to pick a random backdrop. Oops. Surprise. That's our backdrop. And then we're going to populate it with some stuff. We need a ball, of course. Maybe that can be size 75. We're going to need a paddle. And that's facing the wrong direction. And it's kind of tiny. So let's do something like that. Direction 180. That's looking good. Uh, then we'll also need one last thing that is a line so this is how it knows if we lost so I'll put all these things right here and let's let's work on the ball now so when the game starts the ball should pick an initial direction it needs to start flying off that way in some some direction maybe we can uh, set the direction to be between I don't know what's a good down into the right so between like 150 and uh, 30 that can be its direction okay let's let's make that happen for the ball so when when the game starts we can set the ball's direction to be a random number between those values that I picked I guess uh, 130 to 150 yeah 30 sounds good 150 those look normal okay and then we want the ball to just keep moving in that direction for forever so forever loop move 10 steps or so and uh, I guess also we want it to bounce off so you can always do the bounce if on the edge bounce so if I click this now the ball is picking its initial direction if I start again it picks a new initial direction start again picks a new initial direction uh, I guess we actually want the ball to start right here next to the paddle that would make the most sense so let's always make sure that that happens when we run our game so we can uh, go to this place always and the paddle should also start where it's there uh, where it's at so also when the game starts please paddle uh, if you weren't there already go right there and uh, that is motion go to X okay so now this is making more sense it's always always right there I can move these wherever I want they always go back to normal okay and so now uh, we need a, a way to move the paddle and then a way to lose the game alright so uh, the paddle let's work on him some more he needs to move so uh, I guess until the end of time he needs to follow uh, the mouse pointer you can also use like the, the up arrow the space key whatever you want but let's use the mouse pointer this time because that'll help uh, get you started on your assignment so we're gonna follow the mouse pointer in a forever loop so forever please uh, 
And to move the paddle up and down, notice that the x value of the paddle does not move. It's only the y that changes. Okay, so the y is what we should change. So set the uh, y coordinate of the paddle to uh, whatever the mouse's y coordinate is. You see that? So it'll just follow the mouse now. When I click this, it's following my mouse. Whee! And so now, uh, we need the ball to interact with the paddle. It needs to bounce off when we hit it. And uh, hitting is the same as touching. So we'll use this when touching. Okay? And this can act on the ball. Dun dun dun. Just to make our lives easier, uh, let's see how we want to do this. This is this is nice, and I don't want to crowd it up too much. So we can make two separate programs that work at the same time when the flag is clicked. Okay, uh, this is totally okay. So in a separate forever loop, uh, again, this is the ball. We will always check and see if we're touching. If we're touching the paddle. So if we happen to currently be touching the paddle, uh, let us bounce off. So the idea is we're coming in, boop, and we need to bounce off. Uh, it's actually very hard to program with our current knowledge. It's quite hard to program this kind of bouncing. So uh, let's just make it so that it turns around 180 when we bounce off the paddle, okay? So it's coming in, coming in, coming in, and it goes back off. Uh, in the ex exact opposite direction rather than bouncing like that. Uh, come to office hours if you want to learn how to do this. Uh, I haven't decided if I'm going to teach that next time. Okay, so if it's touching the paddle, it needs to uh, point in the exact opposite direction. So uh, point in direction. <clears throat> Actually, we need to change our direction. That would make the most sense. How about this? Turn 180 degrees. Okay, so don't let this uh, confuse you. Uh, I could just, I could have put this right here. Okay, but these are two separate programs that are running when the flag is clicked on the ball. Okay, this one starts and runs its forever loop that moves the ball around. This one starts and runs its forever loop that sometimes changes the direction of the ball. Whee! So let's see if it touches it, and it bounces right off. You see that? Whee! Now that's super fun. But now we have to have a way to lose the game, and that's why that line is important. It, it's hard to just detect the wall otherwise. So we're gonna, we're gonna say that the game is over when this line is hit, okay? So if anything ever touches this line, game is over. All right, so how about this? This will be on the line itself. Its little program will, in a forever loop, always keep checking. Hey, is somebody touching me? Is the ball touching me? So if, uh, sorry, I need an if. If the line, this is the program acting on the line right now. So if the line is touching the ball, then we lost the game. So uh, maybe it should say that you suck. So you lost, something like that. You lose for two seconds. Uh, we should also stop the entire game. So make everybody stop doing everything. Uh, so there's the stop button. And you can see how it's different from all the others um, in that there's no little brick that allows it to, like, there's no indentation that lets it have anything come after it. It is the end, which is the point of stop. It stops everything. There can be nothing after this. That was a genius move by the designers of Scratch. 
So what this will do is it'll just stop the entire program. And our program is these other two things running. So uh, the paddle will stop following the mouse. Uh, oh, sorry, the ball will stop moving. And uh, the paddle will stop following the mouse. So that's what stop means. It just stops the whole program. All right. Let's see here. It would appear that I have a bug somewhere, and it looks like the program is always stopping. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's because uh, I put this stop outside of the if, so it's always going to happen. So forever, do the if statement once, then immediately stop the entire program. It needed to be in here. Excuse me. OK, now it looks like it's working. Uh, as long as we don't hit the wall, uh, that little line in red, everything's fine, the game continues, and the second we let it pass, it says you lose, and then after two seconds the game stops, so we should probably do this in the opposite order, but we cannot. So maybe uh, you lose for two seconds is not enough. Let's, let's have it just say you lose and then immediately stop the game. I don't like it that the ball keeps moving about this. So let's lose. That's better. Uh, the issue is though now we can't see it say you lose. So let's figure out a different way to do this. I do want the stop though. How can we say you lose in a fun way? Uh, well, something that you'll be doing, and maybe I'll give you a heads up, is uh, you'll make your own custom little sprite that says you lose which is hilarious, so maybe we can make our own. And you can you can say things that are meaner than this. You can taunt your user if you wanted to, uh, but this will be what I say. Uh, this will be what happens. Maybe we can put like a little background uh, I guess it can't also be purple. Hmm. Yeah, this is fine. You can play around with this. This is my sprite one, but let's call it the you lose sprite. And it'll start out hidden. Of course. And then the second somebody loses. it should display itself. Okay, so maybe we can make a little command, just like for the ghosts. When you lose, we need to display that you lose. Okay, so we'll send a, we'll send a message. Broadcast game over. That will be the name of our message. And our you lose block that started out hidden will be waiting for the game over message. Once it receives it, it will show itself. So it starts out hidden, and then it shows itself. All right, so now I think we have a game. Uh, there we go. Our game is playing. And let's... Uh, Let's lose it. A, and the game stops. It doesn't follow my mouse pointer anymore. It doesn't uh, move the ball anymore. That is everything that I wanted to show with that, and uh, this is very similar to what you'll be doing in your next programming assignment. So, uh, that's where I want to go now. This will be uh, the rest of your time here. You will create this program for your next programming assignment. You will make Space Invaders, okay? So I want you to follow this tutorial by this dude, and he's going to teach you exactly how to make this Space Invaders game. Play it on twice the speed, like you're probably playing me right now. It'll be done in no time, but this has a lot of useful things. It's like a full-blown program. It's a bit more complicated than what you've seen so far. Uh, I think I've given you enough tools, though, to understand this process, and I hope that you find it exciting and entertaining. 
Uh, please use as much creativity as you wish to use with this. It'll be fun. Uh, so this this guy, instead of having like aliens to shoot, you shoot tacos. So uh, that it's going to be super exciting, I think. So you can change it as much as you want as long as you implement the features from this. So uh, yeah, just upload a quick video of you showing me that you did this, and that will be your credit for that. But uh, yeah, I hope that's fun. Let me save this before I forget. Uh, you can look at that for uh, for any help that you might need. But uh, yeah, we learned a few things today. We made some larger programs with a bunch of different sub-programs inside of them. And yeah, things are getting more fun now that we know more programming concepts. I hope you see that. Okay, so that is, I think, where I want to leave you. And go ahead and get started on that programming assignment. Good luck, and please yell at me if you have any questions. So I'll see you later.